In the new world of global health, one of the most striking features is the sheer multitude of actors involved. They range from several big United Nations organizations to governmental agencies, non-governmental organizations, private philanthropists, charities, universities, large specialized funds, and even big businesses. But the field of global health was not always this crowded. In fact, for much of the 20th century, there were hardly any global health organizations. However, the horrors of the World War II and the devastation that the conflict had left, particularly in Europe, meant that many countries could not adequately respond to overwhelming population health needs. In response to those massive needs, the United Nations passed a declaration in 1946 that established the World Health Organization, or the WHO, with headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. At the same time, the desperate need to provide care and protect women and children after the war, particularly in the refugee camps in Europe, led to the establishment of the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, known as UNICEF. The World Health Organization has been at the center of the most important activities between 1940s and 1970s. Its membership gradually grew to include almost every country in the world and all of them regularly attending its annual World Health Assembly. Arguably the finest hour of the World Health Organization's leadership in global health occurred in the year 1977 with eradication of smallpox. This was a truly historic achievement. It showed how a coordinated effort across many different countries could lead to the first complete eradication of a disease that had previously killed hundreds of millions of people. Soon afterwards, the World Health Organization declared that polio would be the next disease to be eradicated by the year 1990. Unfortunately, the economic stagnation during the 1980s also meant stagnation in health gains for many countries, or even their reversal. This is why the 1980s saw the first serious challenge to the sole global health leadership of the World Health Organization. Its UN-affiliated partner, UNICEF, had a strong leader at the time, James P. Grant, who launched an initiative to reduce preventable child deaths from other deadly infections, such as diarrhea and measles. The importance of UNICEF's leadership in child survival and development in this period was acknowledged at the 1990 World Summit for Children, which gathered an unprecedented political attention, securing the presence of 71 presidents and prime ministers. This was the first time that the global community agreed upon international health goals at such a high political level. The identified targets were the reduction of child mortality, illness, malnutrition and illiteracy by the year 2000. The political momentum in favor of global health improvements was quickly recognized and seized by another global giant, the World Bank. In 1993, the World Bank devoted its annual flagship publication, the World Development Report, to the challenge of global health. It made a strong economic case for investing in health care. It promoted cost-effectiveness analysis as a driving principle that should guide national, regional and global health policies. Under the leadership of its director, Jim Wolfenson, the World Bank proposed to focus more of its expertise and lending on the social sector, including health challenges. As a result, by the end of the 1990s, the World Bank had become an unlikely leading single investor in global health. But with the advent of the 21st century, global health was becoming an attractive field where many organizations wanted to make their mark. Three of the eight UN Millennium Development Goals were directly linked to global health targets. This gave rise to two new major players in the early 2000s. The first one was the largest independent philanthropic foundation set up by Bill and Melinda Gates and later co-funded by Warren Buffett with an endowment in excess of $40 billion. The second one was one of their first large investments, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, Gavi. The aim of Gavi was to negotiate better prices 
and earlier access to the new vaccines through innovative financing mechanisms. A key innovation, known as Advanced Market Commitment, brought together the resources from donor countries, recipient countries and pharmaceutical industry, each one of them expected to contribute to the solution. But some global health advocates found this innovation controversial. They were concerned that the governments of the poor countries would end up subsidizing the private companies in the wealthy countries and that the public sector would end up subsidizing the private sector. Nevertheless, advanced market commitment has been recognized as a pragmatic solution that managed to dramatically speed up access for children in poor countries to expensive new vaccines which would otherwise remain unaffordable to their governments. In parallel to the rise of Gavi, another global health player grew in prominence, the Global Fund Against HIV-AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria, known simply as the Global Fund. This was an innovative partnership between governments, non-governmental organizations, civil society and the private sector. The Global Fund was incredibly successful in attracting donors from both the public and the private sector. In only a few years, its budget available to combat those pandemics began to dwarf that of the World Health Organization and UNICEF. This signified truly seismic shifts in the global health architecture. The new world of global health has emerged in the 21st century and it was very different from the UN-led model of global health governance. The rise of many new players has led to some tensions, particularly about the role of the World Health Organization, both in terms of its governance and its operations. The recent crisis that exposed the inadequacy of the World Health Organization to perform its key roles was the Ebola virus disease in West Africa. Subsequent evaluations of this tragedy have underscored the very poor response of the World Health Organization. Some experts saw this as a direct consequence of the reduction in the World Health Organization's core funding, but also the demise of many of its key experts and human capacity. This vacuum was rapidly filled by international non-governmental organizations, such as Doctors Without Borders, who stepped in to mount the response. It is clear that the new world of global health based on many innovative mechanisms and solutions, will also require innovations in governing and coordinating many new players in order to achieve our common goals in the most effective way.